scripture reading is Isaiah 65, beginning at verse 17. It's on page 624 if you're using that blue Bible. This is a picture of the new heavens and new earth that God reveals to Isaiah. He's going to use language of going from the known to the unknown. So he's going to refer to lifespans, but think about in a, in a season when people's lifespans were short, usually about 40 years, what he says here will go beyond that, and it helps them to think about more than just their short lifespan and so forth. So Isaiah 65, beginning of verse 17, the Lord said, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy, and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad of my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit, and they shall not plant and another eat. For all the days of a tree shall the days of my people be. And my chosen will long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants in them. Before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lion shall graze together. The predator and the prey shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy. In all my holy mountains, says the Lord. And now we turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter 3. We're going to pick up at verse 8. It's page 1019. Keep in mind as I read this, the illustration I used last week of Anna's wedding rings, that little pile of broken, damaged, scarred wedding rings that we gave to the jeweler who then melted them down, thus removing all the brokenness and all the scarredness. Didn't annihilate the rings, melted them down and reformed them, renewed them and remade them as it were to what they were meant to be, a wedding ring that will never die, <laughs> or something like that, right? And so keep that in mind as I read 2 Peter chapter 3, 8-18. through 18. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But... The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? Because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn, but... According to His promise, we're waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since we are waiting for these, the new heavens and new earth, be diligent to be found by Him without spot or blemish and at peace, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him as he does in all of his letters when he speaks in them of these matters... There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away by the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Let's pray. O Lord, whose patience equates one day with a thousand years, because you don't wish any of your own to perish, but that all should reach repentance, aid us this morning as we ponder one last time heaven, and especially the new heavens and new earth. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> 
So for the, any visiting, the sermon notes are on the back of the worship guide. There is a quote, uh, set of quotations there I'll refer to in the first half of the sermon. I would encourage you to keep that there. and Keep your Bible open to 2 Peter 3, because I'm going to be working through a lot of it. Now, when, I were once, when once I was the director of police chaplains in another time and space continuum, I'm, I did it, I did it in another state, actually, I was a director of police chaplains, over us was a paid, paid police sergeant, he was an aging sergeant who was over us, and he was fairly slow in accomplishing much, and he was becoming less and less attuned to the things he needed to be alert to. For example, it's a horrible example, but it'll demonstrate it. While he was at the firing range recertifying, he did one of the more memorable, regrettable things. He was at the firing range, so it was like four or five of those uh, lines of fire, and so his lieutenant was actually two lines over, two lanes over over here. So as he's at the firing range, his pistol jammed, and without thinking and just thoughtlessly, he tried to clear it. Click, oh, it's jammed. And he reaches this way, and he starts trying to work the mechanism. Ben back here is about to have a conniption. He starts trying to work the mechanism, and so sure enough, you know what's going to happen. The firing pin slides out like it's supposed to finally, hits the jammed cartridge, fires the round into the lieutenant's calves, the meaty part of his calves, through one and through the other, hit both calves. Well... After everything calmed down, and it took weeks to calm things down, after the lieutenant healed, and the sergeant had recovered some of his dignity, he and I were talking, and I mentioned to him that he was becoming a road sergeant, R-O-A-D, road sergeant. It's a term I learned in the military. Here's what it means. R, retired, O, on, A, active, D, duty, retired on active duty, sergeant. You can imagine what that means just by the title. He blushed, but he agreed that that's what was happening. So I want you to keep the road image, the retired on the active duty image in the back of your head, because I'll come back around to it in a moment. For this morning, my friends, to help us bring this series on hell and heaven to a close, to a thoughtful close, we're going to spend our time here in 2 Peter 3, 8 through 18, and we're going to see how this passage and what it's talking about hands us patience and perspective, and then bolsters us with promise and persistence. Patience and perspective, promise and persistence. There's your two points. So patience and perspective. Notice how patience comes up. It's in verse 8 and 9 and 15. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. And we often misquote that verse, but the context of that verse is in reference to the coming of the new heavens and new earth and God's patience of not bringing it too soon. Here's how he goes. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And so Peter says in verse 15, count the patience of our Lord as salvation. All over this section from verse 8 to verse 18, there's a lot of patience happening here. Predominantly, there's God's long patience. The Lord is not slow, but He's very patient. That's why it's, it feels like a day with him is like a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. And now put it in our perspective. Peter wrote this passage somewhere around 60, 64 A.D. Here we are in 2021. Can anybody, can I get an amen that the Lord is patient? That's 2,000 years, but I'm going to put it this way. Dear friends, thank God he has long patience. Because if God was not patient, do you know what that would leave us in? A pile of ash and dust. Thank God He is patient. Can I get an amen for that? His long patience, as Peter says, is our salvation. And so predominantly, there's God's long patience, which is intended to build up our long patience. Here's what I mean. Look at verses 12 through 14. When Peter talks about us, he doesn't use the word patience. He uses a phrase waiting for. He uses it 
three times. Verse 12, 13, and 14. Verse 12, he says, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day, etc. Verse 13, but according to His promise, we are waiting for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. And then verse 14, therefore, beloved, since we are, you are waiting for this new heavens and new earth, be diligent, etc. Notice that God's long patience is intended to build in us long patience. The emphasis is very clear. And so what that does for us in one area that's very specific to Peter here, in 2 Peter, is that God's long patience governs us, especially regarding unbelief, skepticism, and even heresy. His long patience is to govern us in the face of unbelief, skepticism, and heresy. Think of chapter 2. By the way, I'm going to do more on 1 and 2 Peter when we come to Advent in the first part of 2022. Can't believe I'm planning that far in advance. But anyways, but notice chapter 2. What is chapter 2 all about? From verse 1 to the very end, it's about heretics. And notice that Peter doesn't say, we're expected to burn those heretics to, a, to the stake, or at the stake. No. He reminds us how God Himself is patient even in the face of heretics. And then the skeptics, look at the very first part of chapter 3. He's talking about skeptics, verses 1 through 7. And so God's long patience, even regarding in, in regard to the skeptics, is to govern us in regard to the skeptics. And the same thing comes up again in the unbelief and so forth, down in verses 16 through 18, which I'll deal with more fully later. God's long patience governs us, especially regarding unbelief, skepticism, and even heresy. In the words of Paul, some of the last words Paul told Timothy, and you read those words before the confession of sin. And so I would ask you to, if you want, just flip that, your worship guide over and look at those words in 2 Timothy 2, 22 through 26, starting somewhere in the middle. Paul says to Timothy, based upon the long patience of God, and I'll prove this in just a minute, He says, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. Now, I'm going to be bold and say this. In my experience, very often when Christian ministers and Christians become quarrelsome, it is at the least because they've lost nerve, and at the worst, they have lost faith in God's long patience. Quarrelsome is usually, I'm going to fix you and I'm going to make you right right now because I don't have any patience with you and God doesn't either. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents. How? With a ham fist? Doubled up knuckles? With verbal stilettos, how does Paul say he's to correct his opponents? With gentleness. If God has been long patient with me, I've got to be long patient with them. That's the point. Correcting, yes, but correcting the opponents with gentleness. Why, Paul? God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Notice that God's long patience gives us long perspective. Now, on the one hand, we grow, hopefully, we grow in long patience, not complacence. I want you to pick this up. We grow in long patience, not complacence. We don't become road sergeants, retire on active duty, doing nothing and becoming slipshod and so forth. But it builds in us a long patience, not complacence. But on the other hand, it reminds us, God's long patience reminds us that we are not building utopia. We are not constructing Shangri-La by our own steam, strife, skills, strategies, and strength. Therefore, We can engage those who hold to heretical positions, skepticism and unbelief, conscious of God's long patience, conscious 
conscious that history and the long term are actually on our side because we're on God's side and God wins in the end. Conscious of His long patience. And so let's take that principle a step beyond heresy and skepticism and unbelief. Just as skepticism and heresy and unbelief have an expiration date, and that's what 2 Peter is talking about in all three chapters and in the end, is that skepticism, heresy, and unbelief have an, end, have an expiration date. Well, just as they have an expiration date, so do suffering, injustice, and evil. Suffering, injustice, and evil have an expiration date. Now, we work toward that which is just and right, and we should be trying and striving to alleviate suffering. All of that is right to do, but God's long patience frees us up. God's long patience, the fact that we can't fix the world, the fact that we cannot bring the kingdom of God into the here and now on our time schedule, this time and this generation, that's God's business, that God's long perspective frees us up to not expect that we will somehow bring about perfection. Frees us up and liberates us so that we do not fall into the mythical trap that somehow our political movements, our public protests, our civil schemes will somehow accomplish God's world rescue operation. Just to go a little bit further with this, even in the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 25, as it's talking about the church, points out to us in one of the paragraphs, the sixth one, it says, even the purest churches are a mixture of error and so forth. I love the fact that it's in there. There will never be a pure church on earth until Jesus returns. It frees us up to quit trying to fix everything all the time in our time. I don't know if you're picking up what I'm putting down, but this is huge and very helpful to keep you from getting ulcers, by the way. And so, we do work for what is right and just. We do seek to alleviate suffering. We do want the church to be healthy. But having God's long patience and that long perspective with it in mind and letting it build in us long patience, we are free from the lies that our present moment are telling us that we live in. Now, what is that all about? What it does is God's long patience feeds our patience and our perspective, which keeps us from becoming trapped, on the one hand, in despair and defeat. God is patient. Lots of things are going to happen for more and more generations. But God is patient. Thank God He's patient. And so I can live with that patience. So it keeps us from being trapped in despair and defeat. And on the other hand, it keeps us from becoming ensnared and entangled in every messianic movement that promises to rescue the world and redeem humanity. It strengthens us so that we are not imprisoned in those all-encompassing big stories that try to interpret everything through very narrow grids, like the grid of power and power struggle, the grid of oppression and oppressiveness, the grid of the all-too-easy single interpretive answers. It sets us free from those things that our world wants us to buy into now. It's always now, by the way. Every generation, it's always now. And it frees us up. Esau Macaulay, this is the quotation on the back of your sermon notes. Esau Macaulay is a black Anglican priest. He's a conservative priest. He's a, he's a black brother. And he wrote a great book that I do recommend to you called Reading While Black. And I recommend you read it. And I recommend you read it slowly. And you see what he actually is talking about, how he puts it, and what he actually pushes against. It will encourage you, I think. So Esau Macaulay says, a lot of important and good things growing out of God's long patience and long perspective. For example, he wrote this. 
This does not mean that a Christian cannot protest injustice. It means that we cannot claim God's justification for violent revolution. I think that's extremely important. It's not that we don't stop saying, well, that's unjust, and we're going to try to do something legal about it and legitimate about it, but it keeps us from saying, this is what God wants. He's on our side. He's in this movement. He's on this political party. He's with this platform. It saves us from that. Macaulay goes on. He says, hungering and thirsting for justice is nothing less than the continued longing for God to come and set things right. The fact that you want you want the end of racism, for example. The fact that you want justice to prevail, you want rightness to prevail in our country, is actually coming from your, what you were made for, the new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. So that's legit. So it doesn't mean that... Uh, uh, um, so hungering and thirsting for justice is nothing less than the continued longing for God to come and set things right. This does not mean that we believe we can establish the kingdom on earth before his second coming. It does mean that we see society for what it is less than the kingdom. We see society for what it is less than the kingdom. I think that's extremely important. Every election season, do you realize you're being fed a line of baloney? Vote for me, I'm the Messiah. I will fix America or I will fix your world. If you don't vote for me, then you are damning the world and America to hell. What are you talking about? Every election season is a messianic movement. And the God's long, perspective, long patience and long perspective liberates us from being swallowed up in that. Recently, I had a conversation with a minister. I won't mention his name because I didn't ask him if I could tell this story. So I'll try to do the anonymous thing or, or, or whatever, right? He was here recently, and um, he and I were, it was after something happened, we, he was going to the airport, I walked him out to, the, to his car so we could go up to the airport, and he told me the story of a woman that he knew he had in his church who had been sexually molested by her father when she was a little girl, and then her dad died as a young man, and she was angry with God because he never stood before the court and got prison and all those other things. She was angry because God's justice didn't fully come in the here and now. Listen, I get it. And I'm not going to tell you why I get it, but I get it. But I said, to, I said to him, I said, you know, what's really sad is that we have the same problem that our health and wealth gospel people have. Our name it and claim it friends have. All the health and wealth gospel and name it and claim it is basically saying we can bring the new heavens and new earth now into this present moment. And even as reformed people, we act that way. We can bring God's justice into the here and now. We have the same problems. It just manifests itself differently. If we are gripped by God's long patience and long perspective, it frees us up from those, from those traps and those imprisonments. And so patience and perspective, patience and perspective help us become so heavenly minded we finally can become some earthly good. But also this, all of this about the new heavens and new earth and God's long patience settles in us, settles us in promise and persistence. Promise and persistence. Notice how Peter does this in verses 11 through 13, and then we'll move to 14 and on from there. But notice how he keeps coming back to this. Verse 11, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, etc.? Waiting for and hastening the coming of the day. Verse 13, but according to his promise, we're waiting for the new heavens and new earth, which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since we are waiting for these be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And then after mentioning the heretics, if you want to call them that, in verse 16, the first part of verse 16, notice he goes on to say in verse 16, there, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand. 
knowing that they just twist Scripture, but also knowing the new heavens and new earth are coming, that God's patience is our salvation, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and so lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So notice that there is an expected tenaciousness, an expected tenaciousness for those who believe God's promise of the new heavens and new earth. This tenacious power, this tenaciousness powers our persistent move onward and upward. Notice verse 11, in lives of holiness and godliness. Verse 12, as we wait for and hasten the coming of the day. Now you've got to stop a moment. What does it mean to hasten? Mike, you just said we can't bring the new heavens and new earth now. We can't bring the kingdom of God in this moment you know, right to this moment necessarily. What do you mean, hasten the day? What does Peter mean, hasten the day? Good question. I'm glad you asked it. I'd like to answer it. To hasten the coming of the day, surely at the minimum, involves praying. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our prayers in God's providence are part of Him bringing the kingdom and bringing the new heavens and new earth. Pray, don't stop. But based upon verse 9, notice verse 9 again. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promises. Some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Part of the hastening the day has everything to do with missions, has everything to do with evangelism, bringing people to repentance, has everything with doing a VBS in a hot summer week in June has everything to do with doing a VBS in southwest Oklahoma in a hot summer week of July has everything to do with those things. That's part of hastening the day. But notice the place of repentance. I think Martin Luther was absolutely correct in one of his 95 theses that he nailed on the Wittenberg church door. To paraphrase what he had to say is that the Christian life is the repentant life. The Christian life is the repentant life. It's not always just about everybody else. It's the fact that we also are to be daily moving in that sense of repentance, living the repentant life, grieving and saddened by our own sins, gripped and grabbed by the mercy of God in Christ, hating our sins and turning from them to God with uh, full purpose of and, 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 uh, uh, and endeavoring after new obedience, to paraphrase the shorter catechism. That's to be our life. It means then, when we've wronged someone, we don't have to be dragged into confessing and repenting of those sins. We recognize it and we go to them and we specifically confess I've sinned against you when I did this. Please forgive me. We're quick to ask forgiveness for sins that we've done and we're quick to give forgiveness to those who come asking for it. It's all part of the package, part of the repentant life. That's part of how we're hastening the day. But the promise of the new heavens and new earth powers up our persistence in diligence. Look at verse 14. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these new heavens, new earth, in which righteousness dwells, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Be diligent is the opposite of being rowed. Be diligent to be found in him with spot, without spot or blemish and at peace. Peter only uses this word diligent one other time in 2 Peter, and it's in chapter 1. So hold your hand here and flip over to chapter 1. Look down at verse 10. Chapter 1, verse 10. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. Be diligent to secure, to show, to affirm your calling and election. If you, if you practice these qualities, you will not fall. Well, what qualities are you talking about, Peter? They were mentioned back up in verse 5. 
for this very reason. Because of God's precious promises, verses 3 and 4. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and knowledge and self-control and steadfastness and godliness and brotherly affection and love. Because if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from becoming ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The promise powers up our persistence in diligence. As we discussed it the other day, hope of heaven will inevitably lead to a hot pursuit of holiness. And yet, finally, I want you to notice the promise also fosters us in us a persistence in another angle of holiness. We don't often think of this as, an, as part of holiness, but it is exactly a part of holiness. And it's there in verse 15. It's the last few words of verse uh, 14, verse 14. The last three words of verse 14. And at peace. Isn't that interesting that Peter, when he's talking about diligence and pursuing this, that at peace is part of it? Hmm. Why is that? Because in 2 Peter, you will notice, chapter 2 and then here in chapter 3, the heretics and skeptics divide and conquer. Heretics and skeptics divide and conquer. Just look down at the last half of verse, or the, in verse 17. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not, what? Carried away by the error of lawless people. Carried away from what? From the fellowship of God's people. Notice that, how the skeptics and heretics are all about divide and conquer. But people, people who have God's long patience in mind, thank you, Lord. People who have been trained by God's long patience and thus have long perspective who are gripped by God's promise of the new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells, work at being stable and stabilizing. Notice how the heretics and the skeptics and, the, and all of those are not about stability. Notice how they are about the opposite of stability. Again, verse 17, there are some things in them that are hard to understand. Or verse 16, there are some things that are hard in them to understand which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. Now, did you pick up what he's assuming Christians have? Something you don't lose, right? Don't lose your stability. Heretics and Skeptics are all about divide and conquer. They're about breeding instability. But I want you to notice how stability is a trait of the Christian family and the Christian life. All of this stabilizing, verse 17, is so that we grow and mature, verse 18. We grow and mature and develop in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior together. Now and unto the eternal day. I think that's extremely important. Dear friends, we live in a hugely unstable time. I don't think there's anybody that doubts it, and if they do, they're just, their head's buried in the ground. We live in a world, I had a friend of mine years ago, a few years back, say to me, he says, Mike, it feels like we're in a social tsunami, a societal tsunami. You know what a tsunami is, right? The big wave that wipes everything out. It feels like we're in a, in a societal tsunami. It is that way. Our world is living in a hurricane. A hurricane of its own making. But that's another point. It's another story. But it's that way. All around us is instability. Things are changing, and they're changing drastically, or they're changing quick. At least it feels that way. And what's the one place people should be able to go and not be swallowed up and torn to pieces by the storms? Anybody? Yes church that's united to Jesus Christ and is filled with God's long patience, thank you Lord, and perspective, and filled with God's promise of the new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. This is the place. It's to be the sanctuary. 
so people can come out of the storm. There was a scholar from, he's from Westminster, Pennsylvania. He was writing a, an article. He's a, he's a big Westminster uh, 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 assembly scholar. He was writing an article, a chapter for Joel Beakey in a book that he had, that was for, in his honor. His name is Chad Van Dixhorn. And as he's talking about the Westminster Assembly, he makes this one statement I thought was hugely funny and important and sad. He said, for moralists, for moralists, the present decade is always the worst. We don't have to get swallowed up in all of the drama and the trauma. Do you know why? Because God is long patient. He's the rock upon which we stand. Underneath are the everlasting arms. And that's what we should be always about and, and aiming for. And so keep that in mind. God's long patience builds in us long patience. So we have, we have that long perspective. And his promises grow in us persistence. And it's then we are so heavenly minded. We really, really are some earthly good. Let's pray. Well, Lord our God, we come to you and are grateful. It's so easy to pass over because we don't think about it very often, but so grateful for your long patience. The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. Hallelujah. Thank you that you are patient with us, that none of us, desire none of us to perish, but to all reach repentance. That you have elect ones who right now maybe are heretics. You have elect ones who right now are, are maybe skeptics. You have elect ones who right now maybe are unbelievers, but you are calling them to yourself, and so your long patience. Glory to God in the highest. Lord, forgive us for our impatience. Forgive us, Lord, for having a teeny perspective. Forgive us, Lord, from being entrapped and imprisoned by our, our society's desperate urgency, which is always being broadcast. And so, Lord, may we together grow in this gracious stability so that together we may grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and to the eternal day. Amen.